Excellent. These are mostly, well, these are, this is a mixture of Canadian and American brands. So there's some great Dairy Queen. Okay. But you're, you're exposed, you're exposed to two to 3,000 pieces of advertising per day. The average American is exposed to two to 3,000 pieces of advertising across the different media. So we are, it's amazing that you can, that you can recognize any of them, <laughs> right? But we are cognitively programmed or conditioned, I should say, not programmed, but conditioned to recognize these and to have potentially an emotional response to something, right? So a and reminds me of growing up in Northern Michigan. Uh, uh, some of these remind you of, of, of some key types of foods or events or things. I mean, this, this goes back, you know, that's the Winter Olympics from, from 10 years ago, but, you know, key, key events in history, athletic history, or uh, uh, but even but the simpler the logo, there's still an attachment to it. That's that's how powerful branding can be because you can have a lot of different positive or even negative attributes attached to one icon or one logo. And so um, that's the power of branding that, that it communicates beyond its name, beyond its logo. And uh, branding is uh, it it it, have, it carries an entire company behind it. So it's an amazingly powerful thing. If you just think of this in terms of, of the general cognitive thinking of, of all of the people and all of the industry, all of the investment that goes behind this one little thing that could be this big on Twitter screen, <laughs> this big on phone screen, but it's still work. But it, it, it works in that um, these brands communicate things way beyond just the product or, or just uh, the values of the company. They, they, Engage and they have entire emotional attachments to them. So, how, many, how many of these do you recognize? Uh, three, three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four, United Way. AT&T. AT&T. Yeah. Oh, that's... No. Wait. What's the one to the right side? Is that United <laughs> Oil Company or Airlines? This used to be United Airlines. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. There you go. Is that Adobe? Like an old machine? Avery Office Products. Oh, yeah. Three paper clips chasing each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is this yeah. one Train or something? Oh, These two... Work. I'll give you a hint. These two have merged. <laughs> train or... Sprint and... Or, I've seen the, I've seen the like, This is now Conica, Conica Minolta. So, what do they do? This is Conica Minolta. Cameras. So this is a cross-section through the four lenses that are inside of a single lens reflex camera. Okay, this one is Continental Airlines. So this is an abstraction of an aircraft taking off. Mm. Okay. So, what's that other one? Bell Telephone, yes, the Bell, Bell, the Bell system, yes. What became American American Telephone and Telegraph, the yeah. AT&T, under the unified Bell system. So Southern Bell, Northern Bell, Michigan Bell, all of them unified under, the, under what we used to call Ma Bell. Um, in the Tribe Paul Quest album, they referred to it as Ma Bell. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that was the Beastie Boys album. Ma Bell, you got the old communication, Ma Bell. You got the guilt communication. Okay, all right. So we, we worked in a Beastie Boys reference, which is excellent. Okay, Saul Bass was a graphic designer in the 1960s and 70s that, that got well, very well known for all of these different brands. So there's Continental. So again, an abstraction of an aircraft taking off. Rockwell, uh, that's an abstraction of a rocket taking off. Uh, Rockwell is known for its machine goods as well as contributes to the space program. Uh, Lowry's Foods, you may have Seasoning salt in your cabinet. <laughs> Lava seasoning salt. Avery, three paper clips chasing each other. Uh, Girl Scouts, that that clover leaf, which is still synonymous with one of the cookies that they produce. Minolta, I mentioned, this is a cross section through the four lenses that are inside of a single lens reflex camera lens. So if you were to take a camera lens and cut it in half and look at it, it would be, there would be those four lenses, two concave, two, co two, two convex lenses. Seems to be a little bit of a theme here with clovers, right? <laughs> Chasing each other, but that's three hearts making a clover. Older General Foods one, I wish they'd bring this back. That's really fantastic. Uh, 
uh, obviously a Caroline theme going. Uh, but but some of these brands, Warner, that was that was on every movie, a Warner movie television show, to the seventies and eighties. Dixie Cup, that's they're still using that brand, still using Dixie Cups. Well, I'm the type of guy get paid for the AT and T logo. Is it still around? <laughs> like look at '83 and then '96. I'm like, how much did that person get paid? A, a, a branding agency gets paid significant amounts for this. I mean, if you saw it, I think the first season of Mad Men is very <laughs> synonymous with that, with with the branding culture and advertising. But and how like Paul State spent like half a million. Yes. <laughs> no, each time Ball State rebrands, which is once about every ten years, it's anywhere from 150 grand to 250 grand to up to 500 grand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, it comes with that. It comes with that. That's the full package. I mean, that that involves the, the first sets of ads. That involves video. That involves web. That involves print. I mean, it involves a lot of that branded package that, that's associated with. Yeah, but, but it, it's it's several thousand dollars, yeah, several thousand dollars. All the way down to the last year. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, brands do evolve. Sometimes they don't. So it's interesting to look at some brands through history and see how much they change or how little they change. So it's amazing how you can connect Goodyear all the way through this history. But what exactly is that? What is this thing? The little white Hermes. Yes, it's Mercury's. Yeah, Hermes or Mercury. It's 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 the winged feet of Mercury. Or earnings, yes. Okay, so that that is something that has not changed, um, but has evolved with fonts and colors throughout the years. How did Nike get started? Well, the company it got started with a track coach at University of Oregon making shoes with a waffle iron. So, but who is Nike? That's Hermes then. The yeah, yeah, it's the victory. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the, if you go to the, the temple of Athena, Nike in, in Greece, yeah, she is also part of the Greek mythology. So interesting connections between Greek mythology, the Roman, the Roman panacea, as uh, the Roman pantheon. Sorry, pantheon, pan, multiple theo god, multiple gods, or yeah. So across Greek mythology, or the Roman uh, pantheus. Theos Pantheos. <laughs> Got to get my languages right here. Um, uh, lots of references to those. So, so Nike or Nike, another a Roman god, and the reference there. But this swish, I don't know. Do you know the history of that? Is that it, did this happened by accident, or was this was part of the first branding? I think it came about this design in an interesting way. But it does represent speed. It represents takeoff. So it's very, I think, connected to some of the ones that I think work for the airlines and things like that. It's an abstraction of taking off or abstraction of acceleration. But it's amazing how little or how much a brand has changed. And it's, it's interesting when they brought it back, uh, how, uh, how it worked. But of course, in our culture, logos get distilled. They get distilled down to their purest, purest essence. And so uh, they still become uh, recognizable over time. Very interesting evolution of the Apple logo. We start with Newton sitting under the tree, <laughs> right? That story, of that, which they, some folks claim didn't happen now, that you know, Apple didn't really fall on his head <laughs> and the idea came to him. But it's very interesting how we go from this classic lithograph logo to now distilled all the way down to this, to this, uh, to, to this version of the Apple uh, and how that remains synonymous with and connection with uh, a, a perception of quality. IBM, similarly, Paul Rand did the famous IBM logo in 1972 that was on every typewriter, every computer up to that point. Now, the, the computer division is now known as Lenovo, but uh, for growing up, there was always a rivalry between IBM computers and Apple computers uh, before Microsoft came along. But, so, international. Uh, Telegraph and they started out, IBM started out as a different name, sometimes different names, but they were associated with, with typewriters and telegraphs, uh, but then became international business machines and then into the three letter IBM. 
interesting that Peacock now is, 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 is starting to really become a dominant force in streaming web, streaming web broadcasting, because as a free version, as a premium version, interesting that they, they pick the word Peacock, but because the Peacock is so synonymous with the National Broadcasting Company, they're able to do that, right? There's a connection between the, the concept of Peacock and the company. But, but we start with, with a broadcasting company that starts as a radio company, right? Primarily a radio broadcasting company. Look at this one from 1953. What is that? The color that make up picture. Correct. That is the RG, that's RGB, the three colors that make up color television, mm -hmm. the phosphorus cones that made up the original cathode ray tube televisions that your grandparents had. Okay, but what is this? What is that? It's a xylophone mallet, and those are the three three notes in B, C, E. Oh my God! Okay, so there's a connection there to the sound of NBC and its branding on the radio, making the bridge to color television in 1953. From for radio and black and white television to color television. The peacock comes later because the peacock to them represented that we are now broadcasting in full color. And these are all the colors that you can see on your screen. The peacock, and, and this basically becomes like a half color wheel <laughs> uh, that, that just took off on the screen. So, uh, so the peacock becomes represent, representational of the different colors that NBC was broadcasting. But it's interesting, they start with the three colors, but still use this sonic reference of the three chords of the NBC uh, uh, call sign, if you will, right? Which is still part of their television broadcasting as well. They still use those three notes. Uh, interesting also that it distills down into something else, <laughs> uh, or into this. This is really fun. I mean, this, you look at the first couple of seasons of Saturday Night Live, you, you see that logo, but then they come back to the Peacock and then continue to use it today. Who is Starbuck? She is a siren. She's not a mermaid, she's a siren. Who are the sirens? They were in the traveling on the sea. Yes, okay, yeah. So they're, they're these mythical creatures that call out to sailors and after many, many months at sea, okay? So there's that connection to mythology once again. She changes <laughs> for over time, okay? Um, but really fun that she exists within this pure geometry, a circle within a circle, mm -hmm. right? So she starts out as, pro as, as, a, as a kind of a, a line art illustration. She evolves into the two, the two the two parts of this mermaid-like extension, but then it starts to disappear and then becomes encased in a circle. There's a joke that Starbucks logo will just be a green dot in the future, and I believe them. <laughs> but uh, color choices, we start with this dark brown, we go into a black and green combination into the green. What does the green do for Starbucks brand? What specifically does the color do for Does okay. Sets them apart from other brands that don't really come yep. together. It is the color complement to most of their products. The green stands out on all of the browns and the coffee drinks and even some of their fruity. Mm -hmm. I was a kid, a frappuccino was called a milkshake. Um, <laughs> but the green is the color complement of most of their drinks, the tannic the tannic browns of the tea, the, the tannic browns of the coffees, the green stands out against that brown. So it is, a, it is an exercise in color theory that the green will stand out against most of the product that you're consuming there. So See, uh, that I can consider spending half a million dollars. There you go. There you go. That's, yeah. We fly. We fly. We um, <laughs> When we fly came out, we, we thought they're missing a word. And that's, damn, we fly. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, Massimo Vignelli just passed away a couple of years ago. Another great advertising design agency came up with the American Airlines logo in 68. So this abstraction of the eagle. So you look at this evolution here from here to here to we're still using this one right now. But this seems to be the hot thing right now uh, in graphic design, this slight shadow, right? Reflection and shadow, that's really the hot thing. In graphic design and production. Yeah. You can use it like the tail of a plane, or it can look like the eagle actually flying at the same time. Yes, you are right. Absolutely. This is what is on the tail fin of every American Airlines plane right now. Yes. That's that's what's on. That's how you can identify them in the line of, of traffic. But yeah, that's that's what goes on the tail fin. But you're right. Yeah, there's a it, the eagle is still there, but it's heavily abstracted, but still very much. Uh, what else? Vanelli. Vanelli did all of the National Park Service brochures and maps still in use today. Uh, Benetton was a hot brand when I was a kid. I don't know if they're still around, but uh, that, was, that was a very significant Italian clothing brand. Uh, the branding books uh, for these different companies are really interesting to look at just as, as graphic artifacts. They're really fun to look at. The fonts that they used. Uh, this Vanelli is really known for infamously promoting Helvetica. <laughs> because Helvetica has taken over the world. It is the most universally loved and hated uh, font in, in history, perhaps. It's one of the only fonts to have full documentary film about it. So Helvetica is a great movie. Check it out. It's about 35 minutes long. It's a very interesting documentary about how Helvetica as a font really took over. It was Vignelli and Associates that really promoted the use of Helvetica as a font. It's called Helvetica because it comes from Switzerland. The official name of Switzerland is Confederation of Helvetica. Helvetica is the Roman name for the territory now of Switzerland. So it is, and then it's been bastardized and changed uh, in, in other fonts like Swiss font or, and then um, Microsoft didn't want to pay for the rights to the font, so they designed Arial which has one variation in the tail of the R <laughs> that makes it different from Helvetica. Otherwise, it's 90% Helvetica. But uh, they also did design the entire wayfinding system for the New York City subway for MTA. So that, that use of Helvetica and the use of these colorful icons to navigate MTA are, are still very much synonymous with New York City and, and navigating that. There's interesting how this becomes like a site section or like a like a design drawing, right? At the same time as a as a graphic design. <laughs> it is similar to that. Uh, it's been. It's not pure. I mean, MTA has taken some liberties with using Arial <laughs> because there are some slight variations in the font. But Vignelli Associates designing both the subway map, a variation of the subway map we use today, but also all of these colorful icons, still very much part of navigating MTA system, thanks to Vignelli Associates and the pattern book that they created for the subway system uh, back in the 70s. Some interesting uses of negative space. C A C Contemporary Art Center or something. So starting to get into some interesting graphic metaphors and the like. Um, black cloth and paper company. These are like black cloth and paper company right here. This is like two large rolls of newsprint paper, and then uh, how they're loaded into a printing press. You've ever seen newspapers being printed? And then this is the paper unrolling. Ohio Arts Council, see the C-A-O-C. Alexandra Alexandra Cortez should use this one. <laughs> so, so you can see the O and the A and the C. So some interesting use of, of abstraction and negative space uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Really a great, great age of graphic design. 
use of simplicity in negative space. See, see, here's the mother elephant, there's the cat. See how they're connected there? I like this one very much. It's kind of a derivative of the Helmer's glue. I think that might be one of the original Helmer's glue. This one's very cool too. But yeah, this is probably one of my favorites right there. But again, use of simplicity and negative space. Anybody's been to the National Zoo in Washington? Kids can identify with those, these logos very well. So they, they have an almost intuitive sense of navigation. And they have a picture associated with it because, you know, Reading and verbal skills may be not be advanced, but a two-year-old can know exactly where the pandas are <laughs> and know how to get there <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, interesting that, that the National Zoo started to use this icons library. Notice that the animals are also classified by where they are. So all the blue are in one specific area of the zoo. All the orange are in another, etc. So it becomes a navigation system as well as an identification system. This is this is the difference between logos and branding and then icons and how we start to use icons to navigate documents, navigate maps, navigate planning, uh, planning proposals and scenarios. But these are all part of, constructed, if you will, uh, part of the wayfinding system for the National Zoo. The UN Commission on Sustainable Development also had a, uses this as their landing page. So this is how you navigate the website. You click on one of those icons and it takes you to these different sustainability goals uh, throughout the, the UN. Charter. So interesting that they use graphic a combination of graphic design, color, and font as a navigation system for their website. So these become very important icons for how to navigate complex information. Uh, some graphic design from here at CAP. This is uh, Brad Hovian, who, who used to work for DMV, but he started out, out at our Indie Center. Uh, he now works for Visit Indie, but he did a ton of graphic design when he led the Indie Center. Uh, through a lot of different neighborhood uh, and uh, action plans. Um, design that connects back into the neighborhoods, design that, that sort of has forward thinking, design that makes reference to Speedway. So really great graphic design skills in addition to his urban planning uh, skills uh, back, built back into the city of Indianapolis. ICDC, Indianapolis Cultural Development Commission, they started to brand different neighborhoods and start to create a wayfinding and mapping system so that folks could start to navigate the city better. And then started to create a brand around each of these, these different cultural districts, which later the cultural trail would connect. So color choice, font choice, tiny references to water, I think, or um, I think this is a connection sort of to the concept of theater. angle of Mass Ave as it goes to the north. You see how those, these subtle things are built in um, into the terrain. But then what I love about this package is that the color scheme works for the web page, publications and brochures, events and calendars, plus when you get to the neighborhood off the cultural trail, there's a map and signage that is all the same color. So you know exactly how to orient yourself to the neighborhood once you come off the cultural trail. The system works very, very well in terms Random identity across print, web, and physical wayfinding. Let me repeat that. The system works really well across print, web, and physical wayfinding. That's the connection between branding, logos, icons, and physical wayfinding of the neighborhood. And then, yes, they paid for these catchy phrases. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is part of it. Coming up with these very clear themes is part of that whole package. Close and far out. <laughs> 45 degrees from ordinary. West of Main Street. I mean, man, you paid for this. <laughs> this is definitely part of it. FedEx changing over time. Fonts that were designed primarily on drafting boards using compasses and T-squares. And then later on, uh, the designer came up, was just playing with fonts one day and found out that this was the one. 
there's an arrow right there in the negative space. Do you see it? So it's hidden, but it's intuitive in that part of your brain sees it, part of your brain doesn't see it at first. But once it's once you point out point it out, you you see it over and over and over. So this is this is almost uh, not extrasensory. It's almost subliminal in that this notion of moving forward can become synonymous with the brand. The graphic designer found it by accident. He was just playing with fonts one day and he said, oh my gosh, there's an arrow between the E and the X. So that now will be part of FedEx for the rest of <laughs> the rest of humanity, perhaps, once they found that out. Just that notion of a subliminal arrow between in the negative space between the uh, hockey logos are interesting because their fans obsess over them. <laughs> they obsess over the history and stories behind it. Okay, so let's unpack this a little bit. Color scheme for the Islanders comes from the New York City flag, which comes from the Dutch royal colors. All right, so 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 Manhattan was bought for a few beads and a, and a <laughs> right from from the from the Native Americans. And so this color scheme becomes synonymous with Manhattan and New York City. The New York Knicks adopt the color scheme. The New York Islanders adopt the color scheme. That's why orange, white, and blue are synonymous with those two teams. You've got a geographic reference with, with, the, with the shape of Long Island. So that's Long Island. And New Yorkers refer to the Islanders as the Long Island Islanders because the Rangers are more the five boroughs and the Islanders are more associated with, with Long Island. They're, they play in Brooklyn, they play in Nassau County, they're about to move to Belmont. But at any rate, there is a geographic reference worked into the logo. There are four stripes on the stick, representing four Stanley Cups. So those little messages are connected and built into logos and systems as well. So they won four Stanley Cups in the late 70s and early Look at the outline first. What do you see? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's either mountain lion or bear. Right? So that's the ear of the bear, the mouth of the bear. What else do you now? Now look at it again. What do you see? Um, sun. Sunset, oh, trees, uh, river. Trees, yeah. Okay, All right, so it's two things at the same time. Star, reference, reference to the North Star, the former hockey team known as the Minnesota North Stars, which later became the Dallas Stars. But when, when Minnesota Wild became the uh, uh, major league team, there was still a reference or an homage to the Minnesota North Stars, the original team, the original NHL team for, for Minnesota. Okay, so lots of different stuff happening at the same time. To make this look flat, as opposed to three-dimensional, illusion of three-dimensional, there's this notion of reflection built in. So it looks like it's lit from the left with some shadow, okay? But see the V, the V for Vegas? So that, that two at the same time kind of connection there. Okay. There's an H for Hartford in gray. There's, there's a W in green, and then the tail of a whale, all connected together. So interesting use of font, negative space, and pictorial image all together. So the Predators, one of the newest teams, they found a saber-toothed tiger skeleton fossilized near Nashville, that became the mascot, just from one, one archaeological dig. So sometimes it's one thing that leads to an entire brand or an identity. Yeah. So what is that style of like graphic design when it comes to like sports and mascots? Does it always look like it has like the same type of yeah. like formula, but like different colors? There is, so yeah, it does, it does, yes. Yeah, and always kind of a forward motion, typically from left to right. 
because in the West we, we we read from left to right, and this would not work in our cultures because some folks read from top to bottom, or from right to left. So, but in 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 sports, I think logo formula there's always a tends to be a forward motion associated with going from left to right, or a sense of speed, or a sense of launching, or a sense of athletic readiness. Yeah, there is a, there is a bit of a formula. But there is some reference sometimes to the Tennessee flag or references to natural architecture in the alternate logos or secondary logos or shoulder logos. So you start to get some connections to local history too. But again, in the 70s, there was this wonderful minimalism <laughs> to things. Okay, let's pick this apart. <laughs> What's going on here? The outer boundary, that outer shape, is an ice rink. Okay. It's the proportions of an ice rink. Okay. There's a letter C, if you look at just the green, there's a letter C there for Canucks, and then a hockey stick that, that doubles as a V. That's it. They updated it to make it more noticeable, right? That looks more like a V and a C, so VC for uh, Vancouver Canucks. But it all starts with this proportion of the ice rink, the outer boundary of an ice rink. That's it. One clear idea, right? One clear idea, and then some some um, updates of things. But but it's interesting that that the 1970 version was so popular that even the update still honors it in, in a way. But I think it's more probably better now because it's more recognizable as a hockey stick. <laughs> but it also works as a V. But it's a very popular logo with that fan base. Okay, so the symbol for a hurricane, but that's also a hockey puck. Okay. Their alternate logo made reference to the three cities of Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, typically called the, the Triangle of North Carolina, those three cities together. Problem is, their alternate logo had a problem. It's kind of fun in that there's a hockey stick right there, but one red flag means storm warning, two flags means hurricane. So they actually got it wrong the first time, <laughs> but then they updated it and made it right. Okay, two red flags means hurricane. So I mean, somebody was asleep at the wheel, but they did figure it out. And then if you look at the negative space, that's North Carolina. Oh! <laughs> clever, right? Clever. Super clever. Okay. So again, lots of things to unpack there. Some are just really wonderfully straightforward and just graphically work across a lot of platforms. Pew does a lot of statistics and data that urban planners use. So this is just a really interesting brief symbolism of data coming in from all different points into a central process. Perfect, right? It also works really well, big and really small. The logo works across a lot of different platforms. It also fits perfectly into the Twitter, <laughs> into the Twitter window. My gosh, how perfect is that, right? So it just it just works on so many different levels. So so you'll see uh, the influence of Twitter on logo design is pr profound because of how it fits into that little circle. Instagram updated. A year later, now everybody's using this circle for the home of that icon. So now you're looking at brands and going, does it fit into the Twitter interface? And so those those become questions uh, for us. Some things that I did a few years ago for our community-based projects program, we did community charrettes across the state. So we were looking at a brand that could work for us. And uh, I started playing with how these different letters could together. We start with the Chicago Cubs C, <laughs> because Scotty is a Cubs fan, and um, started layering those together. So that was that was an interesting study. Um, I started doing some additional graphic design for planners uh, to, to help folks navigate documents and comprehensive plans. So this is industrial development, uh, public participation, mapping, so different icons that help folks navigate a website or navigate a planning document. 
That's actually me. <laughs> at a public meeting, so just that, that's a cutout of me at a public meeting. Um, so sometimes the, the sources for these things can be, can be interesting. Uh, some stuff I did for Fickle Peach. Um, this took two years to get through. Um, lots of discussions about, about the position of the bomber, the angle of the bomber, and then we, we came up with, I came up with a reference to the Berlin Airlift. Instead of bombing, let's let's act like we're delivering. <laughs> okay, more peaceful, more pacifist way of approaching this. But uh, but the Fickle Peach has a lot of military themes associated with it. Red Corps flag, uh, the bomber girl as part of their their logo. So so a reference to a lot of these different military veterans uh, organizations that like to meet there. But uh, three years to sort of get through this process, and, and they they have to put these. Uh, did something for Savages last year, um, purchasing pieces and, and stuff from other graphic designers. You can buy things on Creative Market for sometimes a dollar and, and just save you a bunch of time uh, to start to put these things together. But Savages has a wonderful history in reference to uh, wrestling. The, the owner loves the historic wrestling, old time wrestling. And still is a WWE fan, so he wanted as many references to wrestling. So we started with the ring and started with the three three bells, three strikes. Integrated some ball jars, uh, dealing with championship ribbons and stuff like that. So that became a line of T-shirts for them. So that's 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 on gray and then it's on black. And they have to read how things read on different types of T-shirts. That's important. For a local church, um, starting with a, a, a update or a rethinking of Luther's coat of arms. So this is this is Martin Luther's current coat of arms in, in terms of how it's shared under public domain. Meaning, nobody has the rights to it. There's no trademark associated with it because he designed it 500 years ago and he's dead. So, <laughs> so that's a situation where you can take something and re, re, retool and re-update it starting with some fast sketches uh, and playing around with an illustrator. So we came up with this package, uh, both color and black and white, because we still use Xerox machines. And some things look better in black and white on a Xerox machine than, than printing out the full color version. So this, this, is, this has a shadow on the left, and it's deliberately asymmetrical. Each leaf is different. Just to play with this notion of of not being perfectly the same. I, in, in the public domain version, everything is the same. But I wanted just a little bit of turn here to make it look like it was moving. And so that little subtlety there uh, updates this historic coat of arms as a, as a church logo. <laughs> little turns of phrase can be helpful too. This is a reference to the Queen's poster of Keep Calm and Carry On. So we, we used that at the State Fair a couple of years. A phrase of, you give a man a fish and he eats for a day, teach a man a fish, he lives forever. So turning that around public transportation advocacy. Uh, the Bike Muncie logo I mentioned during our walk a couple of weeks ago. Similar to the FedEx logo, I was playing around with fonts and found that in Century Gothic, the C and the E are almost perfectly round. So I thought, as I was typing out Muncie, it hit me. Just like in America Online, AOL, where the I in Instant Messenger becomes a little person, mm -hmm. if the I in Muncie could become the writer, put them on the C and the E for the wheels, we could have an abstraction of the bike. And it just worked. It was just playing around with fonts, trying stuff out, and it just hit me. I'm like, that's it. The I becomes the writer. So, so that became the Bike Muncie logo, and now is a bike rack <laughs> around, around town. Logos for Scotty's company, Sustainable Communities Institute, uh, a company centered around energy, water, and food. So energy, water, and food, simple enough. And with, with Scotty, you have to go through 20 versions before you like something, so it is, it is something. <laughs> Worth 
doesn't get ignited up with that. That's his favorite green, and that's his favorite font. So sometimes, sometimes a client drives the process around their likes and dislikes. So once once we figured out that impact, which is his favorite font, um, and forest green, definitely forest green, not this lime green. That's the same color as Russia today, by the way. <laughs> Stay away from that. <laughs> Um, once we figured that out, then uh, the three, the three, these three things, both water, water above ground and water below ground. Ah, <laughs> some little subtle references built in as well. Another um, app that we were working on. So these are sketches done on the iPhone in a little notebook app. Um, we were trying to do a community engagement uh, app small towns and so I started playing with versions like that. This was my favorite. We settled on that and uh, so we, we launched it in beta version. We tried it out with students. Uh, it didn't go past beta but, uh, but it was it's, a, it's an interesting design example of how something starts with rough sketches and then becomes a more polished version of it. So that's how it appeared on the screen. So again judging and deciding how a logo or icon appears on a Twitter brand or a Twitter identity or on, on, a, on an iPhone screen. It has to work at that quarter inch by quarter inch. And then you start building uh, some icons and then they become flowcharts. So uh, Scotty's company works a lot with sustainable agriculture and, uh, and, and intensive agricultural systems. So I built uh, a library of icons with the intent that we would use the icons to help label plans and create flowcharts for systems. So this is kind of built into your module here, of building just a, not only a brand around your development, but also a, a library of icons that you can use to label things with. And so those become flowcharts and help organizationally talk about a company's values, a company's systems, a company's components, how they all come together to, to accomplish the mission, starting with the challenge, the problem, the opportunity, and the return. And uh, this was this was for um, for a nonprofit in Baltimore that was trying to do intensive agriculture in West Baltimore and pull people out of heroin addiction and get them trained into sustainable agriculture and uh, food entrepreneurship. That's what this was about. And, but that can become a family of flowcharts. We were trying to get the Orioles to sponsor some of that. Of that it's still still ongoing, but uh, but how the Orioles can start to source food locally for the stadium, as opposed to sourcing nationwide for food for the stadium. How they can start to create entrepreneurship in some Baltimore neighborhoods and start putting getting food into the stadium that is all locally produced. You then take the icons and then you can you can label the plan, or label label drawings or label other graphics. But this is a uh, isometric aerial of the farm. These are food trucks, these are solar panels with an outdoor market, and then residential for transitional uh, transitional folks who are living and working at the farm. Uh, and then we've got some, uh, some vermiculture, bee culture, uh, goats, rabbits in the back, and then, and then the primary farm is the uh, closed loop uh, sustainable aquaponic agriculture, which is a symbiosis between plants and fish. So yellow perch and uh, blue, blue lobsters, uh, their effluence feeds plants and it, it, you can harvest every six to nine weeks. So, so produce many, many tons of food in an indoor atmosphere uh, that can be injected into a lot of different contexts that don't have a lot of water. The system recycles 98% of its has a very high efficiency of recirculating the water, um, uh, even though the fish are contributing to it. But the plants are able to revitalize the water every couple of weeks. There's not a lot of waste in terms of water going in or out of that system. It circulates back into itself. Okay, so that gives you an idea for some ideas for the branding of your imaginary company, as well as some ideas for how how a family of icons can help populate your plan and label your plan and start to create some flowcharts and 
informational charting for your property rights. Okay? okay. So let's progress forward. Our thinking. Be mindful of different housing opportunities. There's a whole portion on Canvas devoted to missing middle housing, including an electronic version of the book, a link to the author's webinar. Start becoming familiar with some of the housing typologies that are part of missing middle housing, and then start to test them on your, on your, on your site plans in terms of how they can fit and start to uh, respond to a real estate proposal. Okay. We'll be working on this for the rest of the month, so. <laughs> So have at it. I'll come visit here in a moment.